Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Technically Creative, uh, our series of conversations with Georgia Tech alum who have found their way to work in the creative fields. Uh, my name is Aaron Shackelford. I'm the director of Georgia Tech Arts, uh, and I'm very excited to be joined today by uh, Maria Santos, who uh, is a double tech grad. She's received both her, her master's and PhD in the ECE program here at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for joining us for a conversation today. Thank you for having me. So uh, I'll just, you know, I'll say a quick few words about your uh, already impressive biography, um, so people know sort of why why we're having a conversation with a with an ECE grad. Uh, but your research focuses on uh, the distributed coordination of multi-robot systems, uh, and a particular focus on uh, modeling heterogeneous capabilities within large swarms of robots. So the reason that's important is because you also explore the use of uh, swarm robotics in various forms of artistic expression, uh, research for which you um, you know, have won awards already, and you're currently a, a postdoc postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University. So that's that's quite a, a CV uh, already. And uh, we're so, so thrilled that you so, took some time out of your very busy uh, postdoc Princeton schedule to, to have a conversation about this. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a mouthful, but yes, thank you. <laughs> so let's just start out because, you know, uh, I, I read a bunch of words um, and, you know, can you say a little bit more in your own words uh, what some of your research um, looks at and, and what are some of the ways in which artistic expression uh, plays a role in, in the work that you're doing? Yeah, so uh, with respect to the distributed coordination of multi-robot teams, uh, I study how you can convert these global objectives into individual commands. And in particular, um, I focus on how you coordinate large groups of robots, like 10, 100, 1,000, you're agnostic to that number, but how can you coordinate them when they have like different capabilities? So for example, some of them may have one type of sensors, other have uh, a type of actuator, and how do they have to distribute and coordinate uh, among them to achieve these global objectives uh, in the best possible way. Uh, with that, uh, I also try to merge a bit of uh, arts in my research. So, so far during my doctoral studies at Georgia Tech, uh, we did two main pieces of work. In one of them, we studied the creative uh, capabilities of uh, Swarm to evoke uh, emotions for an audience. So think, for example, of using a multi-robot system for a theatrical uh, exposition. Like, how can you evoke like happiness or sadness? Uh, how can the uh, spectators understand these emotions in this very uh, non-anthropomorphic robots that compose a swarm. And also we uh, did a piece of work on how these multi-robot systems can serve as an interactive tool between a human artist and a canvas to produce artistic painting. That's fantastic. And, and we should add, um, there's some video on our website that we've posted this let people sort of see uh, some of the amazing uh, work with the robots, because it, it is something to really get to, you have to really see it to, to understand and, and appreciate it. Um, I guess, you know, my, my first question is just, when I'm sure you get a lot, which is, you know, what, what made you start thinking about that there would be either a value or an interest in, in blending this, you know, really intense research in robotics with these artistic or creative principles? Yeah, so I studied uh, music when I was in Spain. I was uh, studying my um, engineering degree, but at the same time I was in the conservatory. And I've been always kind of fascinated by these two very different uh, thought processes that are involved in engineering, which is very structured, and also in music, which is structured as well, but people tend to find different ways of thinking about problems and how to overcome them. So I always try, wanted to merge them both and I didn't think it was possible. So I was a bit uh, frustrated when I finished my music studies by how, you know, um, kind of to the norm it was being in engineering. So I always try, uh, wanted to bring that. And then when I was starting to work uh, in this multi-robot systems literature, basically 
I mean, even when you run a demo to people, people are amazed by the kind of like trajectories these individual robots uh, follow to, even when they're just doing a task, you know, they're pretty interesting uh, to look at. So based on that, we started thinking, how can we use this for our advantage? And I mean, I'm not the first one looking at this, like people are already fascinated by these swarms that they get deployed in the Olympics and in the Metallica tour. So how can you, I wanted to use them more like, okay, I don't want a hundred engineers thinking about this, but I want to give to artists a way they can use these multi-robot systems, these swarms in a more intuitive way. How can we do this for them? Mm -hmm. So can you say more about, you know, as an engineer, um, you know, what, what does intuitive really mean? Like, I think that's a word that we, you know, you know it when you see it, but, but how do you think about, you know, designing something that would actually be intuitive for, for an artist who may not be uh, that experienced in robotics to be able to, to use? Actually, that is a very good point because I feel when we develop these things, we as engineers, we think, oh, this is very easy to use and then people may not think the same. And it happens even to me sometimes, I don't know how to work. I go to somebody's house and like, I don't know how to work the microwave. And I'm like, well, I'm an engineer, I should know how to do this, but apparently this is not very intuitive to me. So I think uh, the intuitiveness comes from being able to just produce these behaviors with very simple rules. So for example, in the case of the um, uh, emotive uh, behaviors, this emotive movement to create different emotions, we thought of it just as, a, okay, how can we use these standard behaviors that then choreographers just want, like, okay, I want the swarm now to be sad. So they just have to specify that. They don't have to worry about, I have 10 robots now or 20, or they move uh, on the ground or they're flying, but just how what type of movement will produce this so that was in that work and in the work of the painting uh we focus more on okay the, the there are some painters already that have looked um preliminarily uh, about how to use these multi-robot systems for painting but it's more mostly works where they just uh implement the rules and let the swarm just do their thing and I thought more as it, okay, how if the robots are like an active brush, so the artist can specify concentrations of color. So I want like red over here and like blue over here, but I just let uh, the multi-robot system do their thing. But you're right in thinking, okay, is that really intuitive? And I think that is a challenge for, we want to provide artists with things, but at the same time, we also feed from you know, people when we get feedback about what is intuitive and what is not, and what is interesting and what is not, and what features should be developed. So moving forward, uh, I expect to get more feedback from people on what they're actually interested in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such a fascinating uh, avenue of thinking about what what creative practice looks like, and you know, and, and the fact that it sounds like you know, as engineers, you have to figure out not just how to uh, you know, have the robots operate in a certain way, but you also have to figure out how those, as you said, like when a photographer says sad or, or, or wants, a painter wants a particular approach to color, you have to figure out how to, to take that, those creative ideas and turn them into something that the robots can understand. That's, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. We want to abstract we want to give the artist control over the behavior of the multi-robot system, but at the same time, we want to abstract them from all these individual, uh, you know, controls and like res management of resources and management of battery life and uh, who is who in the swarm. We want to abstract them from that. We just want to provide them tools so that they can just like deploy these systems for their benefit, hopefully. Right, right. Um... So I want to make sure I get, we had a couple uh, folks who submitted questions ahead of time, and it's actually a lot of Georgia Tech students who, who I think are really, um, you know, interested in, in the sort of work that you're, that you're doing. And, you know, one of them is, again, a question that I think 
you talked about a little bit, but just can you say more about, you know, how how did you arrive at this particular research interest and how did you find your way, you know, into being at a, a prestigious lab at Georgia Tech uh, as you started to get interested in this field? Yeah, so I came to Georgia Tech as a Fulbright scholar just to do my master's and um, I knew I wanted to work in robotics, but I wasn't exactly sure about uh, which venue. And uh, fortunately enough, I took the linear systems class with Dr. Eggerstedt. And I just liked uh, his delivering class, the way he was teaching. And I, I knew I wanted to do a master thesis because I had time and I wanted to continue. I started doing a bit of research in Spain and I wanted to continue uh, on that path. So we started working together. And as some of you may know, like he works on uh, multi-robot systems and uh, we were just talking about possible topics. And then the moment I, in one conversation, we, I told him I studied some music and some music theory in Spain and he got very excited. So we started with this work on uh, controlling robots through chords and harmony rules. So if you have like a uh, human user and you're just playing a single line melody, a monophonic melody, how can you produce these chords and based on the structure of the chords produce the movement of the robots. Now, um, this is quite challenging. I'm actually still, this is still something I want to do, but I feel these two pieces of work that I mentioned were kind of like pieces that I was trying to get uh, within that idea, but then they developed as projects of their own because they're quite complex on, on their own. But yeah, we just started very casually um, that conversation and we just both got excited and we started working on that. So we developed a research agenda where we mixed both uh, these more mathematical and formal coordination of multi-robot systems based on capabilities, but at the same time, uh, doing these uh, artistic works where we're using basically tools that people develop for multi-robot uh, coordination, but for uh, artistic expression. Yeah, and you know, uh, shout out to Magnus, who is such a great, I think he does such a good job of mentoring students in his own work of, of yeah, taking that really creative idea is actually the nugget of the research project and, and not ever saying that that's too far outside the box or that's too crazy. Um, it sounds like that was your experience of, of latching yeah, on. He was, I didn't trust the project. <laughs> I must say, I didn't trust uh, that I could develop a research agenda on this field. And he kind of like pushed me forward and always like supported me, even when I was like, this is, you know, this is not material for a project. And he was like, do it. And I mean, I did it and people are excited about it. So he was absolutely right. That's fantastic. Um, another question we got from students was, we've sort of touched on, but um, you know, are there unique research challenges that you encounter in your work that you would not have faced if you were focused on a more traditional industrial application? I think uh, mostly the challenges has, have to do with uh, one, the complexity of the, you know, artistic dimension, uh, because people have very high expectations of what robots can do. And robots can do very complex things, but, for example, if you see the swarm at Intel, they do very complex figures, but there's a huge um, team of engineers working for them to just do that shape. But instead, what we try to do is abstract those kind of things and kind of uh, generate this um, generic, you know, not tied to an application ways of interaction. So that's definitely a challenge because people really have high expectations about the type of movements or the type of paintings you're going to get. They expect you to get a face, for example. And I'm like, well, we're designing this interaction with a multi-robot system that has a kind of a will of its own. You can like shape them to your objectives, but I don't want them to print an image. That's not interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But I think mostly it's the expectations of it and the magnitude of this realm, because you're not, I think sometimes when you're like, I want to increase 
the productivity in this process by an amount percentage, or I want the robots to do these same objectives, but now I uh, take some communication bandwidth out of them, you kind of have a more um, determined objective. You kind of uh, narrow it down to something that you can achieve. But when you do something artistic, the I mean, and that's what excites me is that the possibilities are endless, but also that comes with an associated difficulty that you must face. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, sorry, yeah. that I would say that is, those are the challenges within doing this type of work. Well, I mean, it almost sounds that, you know, by, by doing this artistic approach, you know, down the line, you've actually made it easier for, you know, if there is other industrial applications or because you've solved such immense difficult questions by pursuing the artistic that, you know, for a very, you know, for a very narrow or specific need, industrial need, you actually in some ways have already solved all the hard challenges for in this work. And so it's, it's opened up so many more possibilities for you. Yeah, sometimes is I mean, for most of my work, I use my research that, you know, was mathematically developed already but for the application. But I think what's it's very interesting for this research, even if you don't care about the artistic application, is that it opens up a lot of questions and a lot of ideas because it's a, a different path of thinking about the same uh, problem sometimes that you just get new challenges that you can apply back to your research. So it's oftentimes that me and my colleagues that are working in these projects, we're working on the project, but then we get other ideas for other more technical uh, works of ours just because the way of thinking about these applications. Yeah, I mean that leads nicely into one of my other questions that it's a hard question but you know a lot of the folks we talk to are you know, they don't necessarily identify as artists but you know they are in creative fields and that's why we call it technically creative. Um, so you know what are some of the ways for you like when you run into a problem or you run into those those challenges what are some of the ways that you you know either step back to think about the problem or, or, or try to think about what are ways in which you have you know found creative solutions to some of the challenges you've encountered yeah i normally well one is time i think uh i believe any creative process just needs time and needs idleness so if you're just thinking about a problem continuously, you're not going to come up uh, with a solution. And sometimes you need to just be doing something else or not doing anything. And you kind of like get these connections or you read a book. Uh, I'm reading right now a book a friend gifted me on uh, painting music. Uh, so very uh, tied to this topic. So one is time. And the other is just like, I just ask people. I just show it to people that are not engineers. Mostly my friends are musicians, just because. And I just ask them about uh, what they have to say. And for example, I was having a conversation this summer. We were having a coffee about something else and we ended up talking about painting. And uh, this friend is a musician and a photographer. And he was telling me about the element of time in music, how it's different from the element of time and composition in a painting. And that got me thinking that indeed, you know, of a new dimension of my problem I had never thought about because we were just engineers working on this. So just talk to people uh, that are not involved in the project and just give it time. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the key uh, lessons, especially, you know, for Georgia Tech students thinking about, you know, talk to lots of people, not just the folks in your, in your classes. And again, the arts create such a great uh, thing to talk about to come up with all sorts of ideas you may not reach otherwise. Um, we have another question from a student that, that to me feels like a very very important question. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Leah is is worried that at the end of humanity we'll be fighting robotic ants and she wants to know what guarantees we have that what you're designing is not going to kill us. Oh. Which is a very common question for for robotics uh, gets a lot. So I just, you know, if you can give us the, that reassurance. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think this is a common uh, fear uh, of a lot of people. I must say, I don't think my robots are very smart on their own. I don't think they can rebel uh, just as of now. Um, I just think, I mean, I think the fear of robots is valid, but at the same time, I just envision how our lives 
where like a hundred years ago, how many tasks we have to do, we're not doing anymore. So I don't think anybody wants to go to the river. Like my grandma was going and I like, wash all her clothes because everybody has a washer in this, their house. So in my case, uh, my robots don't have, you know, they're not learning as of now. They just, is purely control theory from a global objective. There's some local rules and they're deploying them. Now, I think if you work on machine learning, this must be a common concern for people to learn so that the robots don't learn too much, I guess. But I think some people may also be interested on like how robots can be intelligent. So I'm quite an optimist and I want to think that robots are just here to help us with our things and, and tedious work that we're doing nowadays won't be done anymore in 50 years and we won't be reminiscing of the past and saying, oh, the good old days when we had to do all these tasks that we didn't really want to. But I don't have a definitive answer for that question. I mean, you, you did make me think, and, and maybe this is too philosophical, but I mean, do you think that there is a point where, you know, a, we would properly call a robot an artist, you know, not being interfacing with an artist, but, but a robot could be an artist on its own? That's a good point. Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, you kind of like left me speechless there. Uh, <laughs> The way I think about them, I think them as tools to enhance the creative process. So, because the way so far they're doing, there's some uh, kind of pre-programmed, you know, like rules that are deterministic in a way sometimes, but you can always feed them some randomness. So that would influence the generation. And I mean, there's people already creating, you know, music just artificially right like giving a program some way to do it but the genius is probably when to break those rules you know when to break the things because if not like things just get um boring mm -hmm. music gets boring if it's predictable art is boring if it's predictable so i think they are tools i think the most as tools that help us, you know, have new ideas, enhance what we want to do. But I don't expect them anytime soon to overcome human artists because I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I don't think yet uh, we are there that they're able to have that capability of create something. And especially something, I mean, art is so related to um, people relating to the piece of art that you would have to embed that feeling or that conception of their environment into the creative process and I'm not sure uh, how you would do that but I'm sure my AI friends would have some counter answer to what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean surely somewhere either Princeton or Georgia Tech somebody is thinking about <laughs> along these lines. Sure. <laughs> Um, maybe you've already answered this, but you know, so what, um, in your career thus far in robotics, like what's been the biggest surprise to you? And, you know, if you look back when you first started being interested in some of this as an undergraduate to now, like what's, what's been the biggest surprise for your career? I, well, I think I never expected for things to go as well as they have, uh, gone, but for sure, I would say, uh, just how excited people are at these types of projects, I would never imagine that before. Because, you know, I was very like, you know, engineers care about this, this and this. And then, I mean, people care, but people get excited when you present them new things and new th ways of thinking about uh, problems. That's definitely the excitement of people and how interested they are is definitely my biggest surprise. Yeah. So you have been um, you have been very successful, and you know you you've taken kind of that next step that a lot of our students dream of, which is you know go to a great graduate program and then get a, a postdoc at a prestigious institution. Um, what's your advice for for Georgia Tech students who who might be interested in following a, a similar career path? Yeah, like I would say two pieces of advice. Uh, first, just work on something you're really interested in. And I know this sounds like a cliche, but it's really, I mean, I 
was so happy to get to lab every day and like to work with people that I really enjoyed working with and in problems I'm interested in. So that's also my surprise when I work on things I care without, I mean, you need to think about an application, but you don't need to think so much about what everybody else is excited about. So I would say uh, that's one, the work about something like that. And then the second one that took me a long time to internalize, but uh, my advisor helped me with that is just talk to people. Mm. Don't be scared of leaving your lab. You talk to people, people will give you new ideas. People, you would get a sense of what's interesting and what's not. And if you're just in your lab trying to produce 24 seven, you won't get that. Yeah, yeah. That can be a hard, that can be a hard lesson for uh, folks in any field to, to remember that you need to step away and as we talked about earlier, you know, sit and have that conversation about art or food or life or whatever, and you never know what will come out of it. Yeah, sometimes I go to seminars, even now that we can't physically go, but we engage through Zoom. And sometimes I go to seminars. There's a seminar every week here at Princeton uh, about um, neuro uh, yeah, neurology, I think that's how you say it. Uh, and they talk about all this uh, control theory with neuroscience, neurosciences, neurosciences intersection. And it's really not my field, but I feel every time I sit in that seminar, something related to my job, uh, to my work, like just comes up and I just like take some notes. So also that's a piece of advice. Bring, I mean, I am an old school gal, so I take like <laughs> pen and pencil and paper notes, but just take notes of your thoughts. Sometimes, you know, you want to use them again, and sometimes you'll be like six months ahead, and you'll be like, wait a second, I've thought about this before, and you would be surprised at the things you can think of. Yeah, I, I've had the same experience, actually, in, like, neuroscience seminars, if you sit there and talk, and, uh, and you just, you get these amazing ideas that connect, you know, whether to the arts or whatever your job might be, it's, it's always inspiring to hear about the, the work folks are doing in fields totally outside of, of our realm. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left and I did just, I'm just curious sort of, you know, for you, what's, do you have a, um, a dream artistic project or sort of like what would be, uh, you know, a project with this research that you're doing that would be your, you know, that's your goal. That's your masterpiece that you're trying to, to achieve. <laughs> yeah. So tying back to the beginning, I feel like, I feel I fail every time, but what I really want to do is to tie up music and composition into the game. That's my dream uh, project that we're always circling about it. But uh, yeah, just because, um, you know, I studied music, I don't really, I'm not an expert on like painting or photography. Uh, I'm not an expert in music either, but I'm way more passionate about it. So. I just want to do it, but I feel it's so complex that every time we find all these nuances and, and mostly it has to do also with um, uh, how in the moment the music is and how you can represent that without, I mean, I don't want to just make the robots, you know, do some choreographic dance, which has its challenges, but that's not what I envision them to do. I want them to kind of like react and like produce these mov movements to the music. Uh, so that's always my challenge. And I think if you interview me like 10 years from now and I'm still doing research, I'll probably say the same thing that I'm interested in that problem. And I'll just continue to go in that direction and, you know, yeah. Just doing side projects if maybe, but that's my general like direction that I want to pursue. Well, I think we, we definitely will have to have you in, uh, in 10 years, hopefully before then, because we, we've talked about even trying to find a way to collaborate. Um, yeah. The last question before we go is just, um, you know, you were a grad student here, but was there a favorite uh, tradition or place about Georgia Tech that uh, you still think about? I just think... Um, well, I wasn't involved in many traditions because I think it's mostly uh, undergrads that have the hardcore uh, Georgia Tech uh, traditions. I did like, we had some lab traditions about, you know, doing lab retreats and things like that, which were fun. Uh, you know, grad school is not all about working, guys. Uh, it's also fun. Uh, 
Uh, but I think my favorite place at Georgia Tech would probably be the Tech Green in the summer when the campus is kind of empty and you just get your lunch there and like look at the Tech Green and actually the School of ECE in the perspective I would be looking at. Uh, it, that is always like very relaxing to me. Excellent, excellent. Well, we hope you come back sometime and get to get to enjoy that. Um, Maria, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. This has been really exciting. Um, thank you, everybody who's uh, joined us to, for view this on Facebook. Uh, please go to our website and uh, see about upcoming uh, events, conversations with alum, as well as artists and other folks uh, involved in the arts. Uh, thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day.